All right. It's a fact of life that if you live or work or associate in any way with people, you're going to experience conflict. The only way to escape conflict completely is to live in the desert all alone. Now, since that isn't really a realistic option for most of us, we're going to be much better off learning how to handle the conflict that comes up from day to day as we live our life. When people live together or work together or associate with others, there's always going to be some level of conflict that's inevitable because friction is simply one of those signs of life in relationships. However, conflict doesn't have to escalate into World War III every time two people disagree. There's a way to resolve our differences peacefully, a way that, that strengthens relationships rather than destroying them. And that's what I want us to look at tonight and, and, and look at some ways to handle interpersonal conflict when it comes in our lives. Solomon said in Proverbs 20, verse 3, It is honorable for a man to resolve a dispute, but any fool can get himself into a quarrel. Now notice that it doesn't say that you should ignore conflict or strife. It says that you should resolve it. Another translation says that you should avoid conflict. And if there's friction in a relationship, it, the simple fact is that you have to deal with it. Ignoring it is not going to make the problem go away at all. You have to work to resolve it. However, you're much better off if you can avoid the conflict altogether before it even becomes a problem. So tonight I want us to look at three ways that you can handle conflict. Some of these ideas may help you to avoid a conflict. Others may help you to resolve a conflict. Either way, it's going to reduce the amount of stress in your life and help you to get the most out of your relationships. So let's look at each one of these a little more closely. The first thing that is going to help you to handle conflict in your life is to delay your reaction. When someone makes us mad, we have a tendency to want to let them know about it right away. Somewhere along the way, we've been told that it isn't healthy to fume and fret and that we should get things off of our chest immediately. We've been told that holding it in only makes the problem worse. And so there are quite a few folks that, that use that as an excuse to let the other person have it the minute something happens that they don't like. If you've used that strategy in dealing with conflict, you've probably already learned that it doesn't really work. Sure, you may blow off some steam. You might feel a little better initially, but if you vent a little too much, you're often going to cause more damage than you can repair. And more often than not, you end up looking somewhat foolish. Obviously, if you're having conflict with another person, you can't hold it in forever. And I'm not suggesting here that you need to. I am suggesting that when there's a conflict in a relationship, you need to delay your reaction long enough to simply evaluate what's going on. You don't even have to yell or throw a fit in order for this to be an issue. One of the churches that I served in at one point, we had a family that had three children, three boys. And, and I identified a lot with this family. 
with the boys specifically. Uh, and, and mainly because they reminded me, except for their ages, which they were a little farther apart in ages, but they reminded me of, of my two older brothers and myself. The oldest was a rather large guy. He was large for his age, not only in height, but, but I mean, he was a little on the chunky side which reminded me of my oldest brother quite a bit. And then there was the middle son, who was small for his age, which was the case with my middle brother, the next one down. And then there was the youngest child, who was probably one of the sweetest boys that, okay, maybe not, okay. Honestly, he was, he was a little bit spoiled. Um, uh, kind of like I was being the youngest as well. Well, all three of these boys roughhoused quite a lot. In fact, more than I would have liked. Um, and, and the oldest was generally hurting one of the younger ones. Not because he was intentionally trying to hurt them, but simply because he didn't realize his own strength and size. Once again, very much like me growing up and, and, and my oldest brother. Well, their parents were both in choir and the boys would just kind of hang out, if you will, during choir practice. We had choir practice on Wednesday nights following all the services. So while we were in choir, they were had basically full run of the rest of the church and then go do stuff. Um, anyway, after choir one night, I was putting the music away, trying to get everything back in order for Sunday morning, and the mother came in and said that she needed to see me in a specific room. So I went with her, and she showed me a broken window in this room. Understand, it was late. I was tired. I knew that there was no way that I could get any glass to fix this window this late at night. But it also meant that I was going to have to go try to find some cardboard and some tape. I was going to have to fix this before I went home. So I was a little frustrated. And I said, so how did Jake, the older child, how did he break this? Well, it turns out, Jake wasn't the one that broke it. It was the younger one who had done it. And, and she became somewhat indignant in the fact that I immediately jumped to the conclusion that it was the oldest one who had broken the window. And I think she was probably right in getting indignant because I jumped to a conclusion that wasn't correct. Flying off the handle is a very easy thing to do. Flying back onto the handle is a very tricky maneuver, to say the least. I recommend that before you blow up at anger, at someone, give yourself some time to think things over a little bit. Proverbs 12, 16 says, A fool's displeasure is known at once, but whoever ignores an insult is sensible. I once served with a pastor in Topeka, actually. Um, and, and he had no control over his reactions to what went on during the services. Normally this wasn't an issue except when it came to business meetings. Okay? He had what I would call his instant mad face 
<laughs> you knew immediately if he was angry. And, and that happened many times in business meetings. So one of the things that, that I helped him work on was controlling his responses, controlling his, his facial features so that you could tell if he was getting upset or not. We also worked on his speaking responses, including not saying anything at all in kind of a knee-jerk reaction. A, a, a delayed reaction is going to give you time to evaluate the situation. It's going to help you to determine if it really is worth getting upset about or even worth discussing. Maybe after thinking it over, you're going to realize that you overreacted. Maybe you'll discover that you didn't have all the facts. Maybe you'll discover that things weren't what they seemed to be. Waiting to react is going to give you time to reflect. And it's going to save you from having to apologize later on. Proverbs 17, the very first part of that, says a quick-tempered man acts foolishly. And then further down in that chapter, Proverbs 14, 29 says, A patient person shows great understanding, but a quick-tempered one promotes foolishness. The first thing that's going to help you to handle conflict is a delayed reaction. Think of it this way. If you have a problem with procrastination, this is one area where that could come in very handy. Okay? Procrastinate your anger. Delay for however long, at least a few hours, flying off the handle until you've had some time to evaluate the situation. The second thing you need to do is to say it gently and firmly. Several years ago, the show 2020 aired a segment about parents who yell at their children. They placed cameras in the homes of a few volunteers, though why anybody would volunteer to do this, I have no idea, okay? But, but they left these cameras, they allowed the show to bring in cameras and they placed them in and they left the cameras there for several weeks capturing on film every detail of the way the parents related to their children around the clock. Okay? Now one mom in the report had a style of parenting that you could probably only describe as being loud and louder. Okay? She would yell at her children constantly. In fact, so much that they had just become accustomed to it. And, 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 and because of that, they simply ignored her. So she would yell a little louder. And then even louder still, until she finally got their attention. And since her words consisted mainly of these empty threats, she was never really taken seriously. I can't help but think that if she had ever tried to speak at a normal volume and then actually followed through on what she had said, I think she would have quickly discovered that all that screaming really wasn't necessary at all. When you're in conflict with another person, you don't have to put heat on your words in order to have an impact. You only have to be willing to follow through with what you say. The problem is, sometimes we fool ourselves into thinking that it's easier to intimidate someone by yelling and screaming than it is to actually deal with the problem. We need to keep in mind what Solomon said in Proverbs 29, verse 11. 
He said, a fool gives full vent to his anger, but a wise man holds it in check. You all know who Dave Ramsey is? Okay, he's a fi Christian financial wizard. wizard. Yeah, he, 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 he wrote a book, probably his best-selling book, was called Financial Peace. And, and he once said that the reason collection agencies use such abusive phone tactics is that most of the time it's the only option they have. Suing for a bad debt is generally not an option that most places use. Getting a court judgment is costly, it's time consuming, and oftentimes it's very futile. It's often easier to call the debtor names and to shame them into paying the bill. He said the more powerless they are, the more abusive they become. Unfortunately, I've seen the same thing to be true with managers and coaches and parents and pastors and school teachers, anybody that's in a leadership position. The less weight your words carry, the more volume they seem to have to have behind what it is that they say. It's extremely difficult to resolve a conflict with another person if you don't take seriously, or if they don't take seriously, whatever it is the other person's saying. Whenever you're attempting to resolve a conflict with someone, you need to say what you need to say gently, and you need to say it firmly. Don't need to call them names, don't make threats that you don't intend to carry out. Just say what you mean and mean what you say. I had an uncle that lived in Virginia. He worked at the Pentagon uh, as I was growing up. And, and we had decided, family had decided one year, we were going to go to Washington, D.C. and go see him. Two-week trip. Um, so we loaded up the station wagon. Uh, there were four adults and four children in this station wagon. And that's back in the days when, you know, nobody had to wear seat belts and, you know, the, we were sprawled out in the back and on top of the luggage and just anywhere we go. Anyway. So here we go. But because of where he lived, which was kind of off the beaten track a little bit, lived on a, lived on a farm, we were going to meet him in Washington, D.C., which we did. Well, by that time, my two brothers and myself and my cousin, we were kind of car weary, you know? You know how kids get after a while in the car, back when long family vacations and you drove everywhere. Some of y'all remember those, don't you? Well, we'd gotten a bit irritable with one another, uh, to say the least. And there were many times that the station wagon would pull off the road and one of the adults would have to deal with things. But once we got to D.C., we had walked around a little bit, had sightseen a little bit, uh, and, and we were all excited about that, but then, but then we were heading to his house. We didn't really get to sightsee a whole lot. Well, the station wagon pulled off at one point. He pulled off too. My uncle did, because he was in his car. And they dealt with something. They were trying to deal with something. And my mother was crying. That, that may sound like a horrible thing that we made my mother cry, but, and, and it was. I'm, I'm not making that lightly in any, way, in any way, but my mother cried all the time at everything. 
she, she was just a very emotional woman. Um, well, my uncle got out of his car and walked, came to the back, came back to the station wagon and saw what was going on. So he leaned his head in the window. Now you've got to keep in mind, this was a colonel in the army. He dealt with, he was an authority figure, let's just put it that way. He dealt with a lot of things and dealt with people. And he leaned his head in the window and said very calmly, you boys need to settle down because if this station wagon pulls off the road again, when you get to my house, I'm going to spank you all. We were like, okay. Didn't really mean much to us because we hadn't been around him that much to really deal with him that much in a dis disciplinary way. He got back in his car, started off. We followed in the station wagon. Wasn't long before another conflict arose. Station wagon pulled off again. As I recall, my oldest brother was giving Indian rope burns to one of us. Y'all know what those are? That's when you, you know, y'all remember those, right? I'm getting some folks that are going, I don't have a clue what you're talking about. Anyway. If you had brothers, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they weren't pleasant, okay? Anyway, it pulled off. They handled it. My uncle didn't get out of his car. When they signaled that it was time to go, we went. Finally made it to his house. We got everything unloaded, got the car unpacked. And he calmly said, hey, boys, you need to come into my office. We were like, oh, cool, get to go in the office. So we all walk in the office, and he shuts the door. And he very calmly then says, I told you all, if this station wagon pulled off the road again, I was going to spank you all. He's very calm. We then became uncalm. <laughs> At that point, I started crying before he'd even touched me because I was a very emotional child as well. <laughs> and he spanked us very well, I must say. For the rest of that trip, we were there. If he said something, we snapped too. Because we knew if he said, if, if that happens, this is going to happen. We knew he was going to follow through on it. And we didn't want him to follow through on anything. All of us need to learn that if we approach a matter by expressing ourselves gently, and firmly, it's a much better option than if we take the opposite approach. If we yell and scream, if we get huffy, if we make sarcastic remarks, if, if, if we remind them later what problems they created, if we make empty threats, then ultimately nothing will get resolved. If you're having a conflict with someone, say what you need to say. Make an effort to say it gently. You don't have to be mean about it. Make an effort to say it firmly, without threats or ultimatums. Simply tell the other person your perspective on the problem. Solomon said in Proverbs 15, verse 1, a gentle answer turns away anger, but a harsh word stirs up wrath. That proverb 
You know, if everybody in the world took that proverb to heart, I think three-fourths of the conflicts that there are out there would probably disappear. Yeah. The third thing that is going to help you is to strive for a solution. Think of a conflict that you may currently be facing. Do you find yourself having the same argument again and again, day after day? Do you find yourself repeatedly telling someone or repeatedly being told everything that's wrong with a relationship and yet nothing ever gets fixed? And that's the course that a lot of marriages, friendships, parent-child relationships, and work-related conflicts tend to take. People want to go on and on and on about the problem, but they don't want to work towards finding a solution. When you're mad at someone, telling them what they've done wrong isn't nearly as effective as discussing what can be done to make things better. Obviously, discussing the problem is a part of finding the solution. But if all you do is talk about the problem, nothing gets fixed. If you're having a conflict with someone, most of the time it's because they're doing something that you don't want them to do or you're doing something that they don't want you to do. And in order to resolve the conflict, one of you is going to have to change your behavior or one of you is going to have to change the way you feel about the behavior. If you want to resolve the conflicts in your life, you have to be willing to stop dwelling on the problem and begin focusing on a solution. The first church that I ever served in full time, there was a couple in the church that I became very good friends with. Their daughter was in the youth group and I was the youth minister and music and youth minister there. So I was very close to them. Was over at their house a lot because I was at that point, I was still a single guy. And I was in a very small town in Kansas, Belle Plaine. You know where Belle Plaine is? South of Wichita. Little bitty place. Won a whole lot to, I mean, they like rolled up the sidewalks at night, you know, when, the, when, the, when everything closed. Won a whole lot for a single guy necessarily to do, except, you know, I sat in the trailer and watched TV and make food. I mean, there just wasn't a lot to do. So they invited me over. I was, I was at their house a lot, like a lot. I was at their house. And, and, and one of the things that I noticed with them is that they argued a whole lot. I mean, they would yell at one another a lot. And they would both bring up past things, past things that the other one had done uh, and, 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 and and, and most of the time, it was things that I didn't ever see in the person. Okay, they kept bringing this stuff up, but I, I didn't ever see that behavior in the person that they were yelling at about. So in my head, I thought, that person's already changed. They've already changed that behavior. However, the other spouse couldn't seem to let go of how it used to be. And they'd yell at one another. And when one of them would start, then the other one had to naturally retaliate and yell back. Each of them tried to find a solution, I think, but, but both of them wanted to keep focusing on the problem that the other one had. Now, it probably didn't help much that I found all this back and forth humorous. Um, I was a single guy. In my head, I kept thinking, well, I'm never going to be like that. And, and, and so I found it somewhat humorous, just their back and forth that they would do. But the girl once confided in me, 
she said, once said, I don't think my parents are ever going to be able to get along. I never saw true maliciousness in their back and forth. And I knew that they loved one another. But their daughter, what she saw was that they are never going to get along. If you want to resolve the conflicts that there are in your life, you have to be willing to let go of the conflict and start directing your attention towards a solution. Proverbs 15, 18 says, A hot-tempered man stirs up conflict, but a man slow to anger calms strife. So we need to strive for a solution to conflict. You don't have to keep reminding the other person what they did wrong. Once they've taken steps to make peace, then you've got to be willing to then let it go. Spiritually mature people aren't interested in keeping a conflict alive. They're, as Solomon said, more inclined to calm and to avoid strife, to try to cover wrong whenever possible. So if you're in conflict with another person, you can't ignore the conflict. You have to deal with it. And you deal with it by striving for a solution, not by simply revisiting the past day after day after day. If you have a job, if you have a spouse, if you have children, if you have neighbors, if you have friends, if you go to church, you're going to have conflict. It happens. But you don't have to live or work in a war zone. You can avoid or resolve the conflicts that are in your life by approaching them with wisdom. Proverbs has a lot to say about conflict. That means that you delay your reaction until you've had time to cool off a little bit and evaluate the situation. It means speaking your mind gently and firmly. It means striving for a solution. If you try all of those things, I believe you'll experience peace in your life and in your relationships the way God wants it to be. Take out your prayer sheets, if you would.